Indonesia, a country with a huge potentials, growing middle class and cheap laborers. But I got friends, they are going back to Sydney for goods, because things don't work out as they expect. There's a gap between reality on the ground and what looks good on the paper. Some fail to adapt or refuse to adapt how things work at the street level. This video is based on their own experience in Jakarta and my own observation as well. If you plan to start a business in Indonesia, then I hope this video will give you some insights and plan what to expect. Some of the things that I share might not be great to hear, but unfortunately, that's the reality on the ground. First unwritten rule, be prepared to pay facilitation money. Ask any Indonesian, how did they get their driving license? If they are like me, then probably they just pay. 99% of the people that I know, they just pay for their driver license. There's no knowledge tests, no driving tests. If you try to follow the rules to the letter, it's not going to get you anywhere. And Simon applies for the business. You have lots of necessary paperwork, and you have done your due diligence, you follow the rules to the letters, but still, you hear nothing. Or there's always something wrong, or worse, you got a visit from official. I'm not going to name the institution here. It seems there's always a fault in your application. So what's wrong here? Well, welcome to the bureaucrat mentality. We have a saying, kalau bisa dibikin susah, kenapa harus bikin gampang? Why make it easy if you can make it hard? We, Indonesian, call this phenomenon UUD, ujung-ujungnya duit. At the end of the day, it's all about the money. Indonesians are master of the indirect language. Causing you trouble is our subtle way of saying you need to pay us more. So how do you pay uang pelicin facilitation money without offending them? You can say things like, tolong dibantu ya pak. Please help us to smooth things out. And nanti ada uang rokok. I will pay you for your trouble. Next is, how much do you need to pay them? Well, every situation is different. If the official name you the price, then you can negotiate it from there. Generally, the bigger your business, the more they expect you to pay. I got a friend, um, he's the owner of the factory, and he was expected to pay 100 million rupiah. That's roughly around 10,000 Aussie dollars. What if they don't name the price, then you just have to increase your payment until they stop causing you trouble. Just to be clear, what I share here is not legal, but unfortunately, this is what it is. If you can get what you need, we are paying facilitation money, and by following the rules to the letter, then fantastic. You can skip this video altogether now. If you find yourself you need to pay Wang Pulichin, let's go to the un annex unwritten rules. Hire a middleman to do the dirty work and have a CCTV installed. As the owner, you don't want to get involved with CID officials directly whenever possible. One, because they will smell blood and they will ask for king's ransom. Two, you want to keep your reputation clean and intact. By dirty job, I'm talking about passing the money to the CID officials, not, hit, not killing or hitting someone, all right? And no, I'm not suggesting you need to sacrifice your employee to keep your chef clean. Sometimes playing dumb will do the trick. Like a friend of mine, every time a CID official knocks on his door, he keeps saying that, well, the boss is away, and I'm not the final decision maker here. If the official start to making scenes or get angry, then he would politely point me to the CCTV. Sir, um, I will get into trouble if I give you um, the boss contact details. Please come back later. Indonesian make me God-fearing people. There's nothing else they fear more than being mad fire for the wrong reasons. At this point, they will leave you alone. When they come back later, you can tell them, well, this is the, this is the money that you can spare at the moment because um, time is tough for the business. Remember, they don't want you to get out of the business. They want you to run the business so they can milk you. Also, you need to do this by the middle man. Or at least you need to pretend that you are not the final decision maker. When dealing with the CID official, there's often there's no room to maneuver. 
unless you have a backing from higher up. Third unwritten rule, add pungli to your operational costs. Pungli or pungutan liar, illegal charge, is so endemic in Indonesians. All business owners that I spoke to include this as part of their operational costs. The preman, tongues, they don't call it pungli, they call it uang keamanan, security fees. They are self-proclaimed local officials extorting money from the businesses. Again, have CCTV installed in your business premise, parking lot, front door, or anywhere. I can't stress this enough. CCTV is not going to protect you from Preman, of course. It's just there to deter them from committing violence. If things turn ugly, then at least you have the footage as an evidence. Unless your shop is in a luxury shopping mall, how everyone I speak to, they expect to get a visit from Preman at least once a month. Can you report that to police? Yeah, of course. But if it's not going viral, then probably they're not going to look into that um, seriously unless you are a famous YouTuber like me. Unwritten rule number four. Dress to impress and guard the trust with your life. Kena tipu, being deceived, step from the back, scam. It's one of the greatest fears that potential um, business partner or client when they engage a newcomer. My relative owned a public accounting practice. Back in the early days, he didn't have um, a lot of money, so he always needed to scoot to the client's premise. Once he got there, the client, the potential client asked him, um, how did you get here? He said, um, by car, of course, it's parked somewhere far because I can't find the parking here. He didn't want to lie, but he knew that um, his, his chance of securing a business is pretty slim if, um, he, if the potential client thinks he's not established enough. He might be more tempted to scam to stab the client from the back. Same story with other friends. He always wears a branded shirt and watch every time he meets someone new. It's not because he loves luxury items, but it's more about like um, a signaling to the potential client saying that, don't worry, I'm successful on my own. Look at my shirt, look at my watch. I have something to bring to the table. In their world, no one wants to waste time with Mr. or Miss Nobody. That's the irony. With the shady officials, you want to look poor. With a potential client or with potential business partner, you want to look rich. Of course, dressing well only gets you so far. It only gets you your foot at the door. But at the end of the day, it's about trust. Indonesians like to know you personally before they go into the details of the business. So don't get offended if you think that they are pretty slow because they want to, to know you as a person first before they go into the business with you. So that means that sometimes um, having the best offer in the market is not enough. Take my friend for example. He was desperate. He was about to go bankrupt. He needed to sell his factory in Pulau Gadung, Jakarta Industrial Estate. He only got one offer, one, but he refused to take the offer because the potential buyer is a well-connected man and famous for not paying up. So the deal is off, even though he's really desperate for the money. Yes, we do have rules of law and the court system, but if your rifle is well-connected man, then your case is as good as that. So keep your reputation clean. The trust your business partners and clients have in you will weather you through the bad days in the business. That's it for me guys. Please give it a like and subscribe if you learn something new. And if you plan to start a business in Indonesia, then I wish you a great success. Thank you. See you next time. Bye.